Welcome to today's webinar, GPS Vulnerability Mitigation Using Inertial and Alternative RFPNT, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor of the event, Spirant. I'm Danielle Pesta from North Coast Media, Digital Editor for GPS World, and I will be the moderator for today's event. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars and will also be emailed to you tomorrow. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways in which you can participate during today's presentation. Please notice the Q&A panel on the left side of your console. If you have a question, type it in the panel's text box, then click Submit to place your question in queue. You may also use the hashtag GPSWorldWebinar on Twitter to submit questions during today's event or to enter into discussions with other attendees. We encourage you to ask and enter any questions you may have for our speakers during the presentation, and we will address these questions at the end of the event in the Q&A portion. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, you may use the same Q&A panel to the, uh, to the left of your screen there to submit your issue, and Assistant Producer Aurora Harris or I will personally assist you. You may learn more about our speakers by viewing their photos, bios, and email addresses in the panel located in the upper left-hand corner of your console. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can also share the webinar's title, description, and URL with your friends or colleagues using the Share This widget. And finally, at the bottom right of your console, you will find a PDF of today's presenta presentation slides, um, which you can download, as well as a link to visit Spirant's website. Now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Today we will be hearing from Jen Smith, Director of Business Development for Spirant Federal Systems. Jen joined Spirant Federal in 2004. She has responsibilities in business development as well as general operations. She also has experience in project management and contract negotiations. We will also be hearing from Naveen Joshi, Director of Business Development and Strategy for Navigation and Cockpit, Cockpit Systems for Northrop Grumman Mission Systems. He sets product strategy, shapes technology roadmaps, and advises the company leaders on the application of P&T technologies. His previous roles at Northrop include Program Director, Program Manager, Engineering Manager, and other roles in engineering. Next up will be Mark Holbro, Senior Director of Engineering and Product Development for Spirant Communications. Mark's 30-year career has concentrated on innovative design, development, and successful commercial commercialization of electronic test equipment. In his current role, he is responsible for the technical team management, new product design, and future direction of Spirant's portfolio of world-leading P&T test solutions. And finally, we will be hearing from Roger Hart, Director of Engineering for Spirant Federal Systems. Roger joined Spirant Federal in 2015 and he has responsibilities in engineering, development, and support, sales, and customer training. He has also worked in development of spacecraft navigation systems, including GPS, for civil, NASA, and defense applications since 1986. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to Jen Smith, who will kick off the presentation. Jen, take it away. Thanks, Danielle. And hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'd like to uh, start off our content today with a little background and a quick summary of the policies and directives surrounding GPS vulnerabilities and the mandates to both improve GPS and to develop alternative positioning technologies. You'll notice as we walk through these slides that we see a shift from the 2004 policy language in talking primarily about strengthening GPS and that alternatives are something we should look into to the current language where alternatives are immediately necessary. Okay, so here we go. Um, as we all know, because GPS is accessible to everyone, it is accessible to actually everyone. For decades, bad actors have increasingly become the source of many of the vulnerabilities that plague GPS, and now it's easier than ever to interrupt. GPS jamming devices can be found anywhere and everywhere, even on Amazon. 
In just the last five years, China and Russia have collectively been linked to more than 10,000 episodes of GPS interference. In a less sinister way, domestic airports have had their navigation systems inadvertently disrupted when some truck drivers tried to mask or hide their own whereabouts from their employers. Space weather and other challenges also threaten GPS's reliability. Because our reliance on it is tremendous, of course, that reliance puts us at risk. So in 2004, George W. Bush's White House issued the U.S. Space-Based Positioning, Navigation, and Timing Policy focus on mitigating our vulnerability. You can see some of the language of that policy here. But basically at this point, we knew we relied heavily on GPS. And even in 2004, most infrastructure was based on GPS technology. Because our dependence on GPS, civil and military systems were vulnerable to interruption of service that could cause anything from inconvenience to catastrophe. And so in this policy, the mandate was make GPS better and make it more reliable. And in this policy, we also begin to see official language about developing a backup to GPS, but that isn't the focus. In the last several years, the government has become increasingly insistent that we mitigate this risk of over-reliance on GPS. Resiliency has become the focus, and resiliency was to be the result of not only making GPS better, but by augmenting it with alternative technologies. The National Defense Appropriations Acts are a series of laws passed every year that specify how to allocate the funds from the federal budget. The 2018 NDAA appropriated funds for DOD, DOT, and Homeland Security to study alternative PNT technologies. And in that same year, President Trump issued the complementary 2018 National Timing and Resilience Security Act. It directed the government to develop a reliable alternate system within two years. And the language you see at this point in time was referencing a backup, which sounds like it's suggesting a replacement for GPS, but that hasn't happened. Not only has an alternate system not been named, but we are now framing the work that's being done here as developing alternatives in the plural. Since then, Washington has been getting more direct with the directives. We see overlap and repetition amongst the orders and policy statements. The 2020 Strengthening National Resilience Through Responsible Use of Positioning, Navigation, and Timing Services is a really long title that required contingency plans for the failure of GPS and also put bigger teeth into the mandate to develop new PNT technologies, stating that federal contracts would have requirements for such technologies within a year. The December 2020 GPS policy tells the world that we're not walking away from GPS. It recommits the U.S. to provide GPS to all. And here again, we're focused on security and not replacement. And finally, in this year, we have the Space Policy Directive. And again, we're going to continue to improve GPS. We're going to make it more secure. GPS-3 satellites will be replacing aging technology. The newer satellites are, of course, more resilient and have stronger signals, which makes them harder to jam and spoof. This directive also says we're going to look for alternative sources of PNT from the private sector and from foreign technologies. But now we're seeing requirements that are more than just requests. Withholding of funding and authorization to reallocate funding are pressing the issue. Washington is saying it's time to develop alternative PNT solutions. And you can see some of the requirements of the 2021 NDAA on the slide. One to note specifically is that future PNT systems will not necessarily be military only. In summary, we hear a lot about developing a backup for GPS, and there are many voices in this conversation. But what we have actually been tasked to do is develop a portfolio of PNT options. In order to avoid another single point of failure technology, we are not looking to replace GPS with a single backup. The task before us is to develop a range of alternative PNT solutions that complement and support GPS. It's an interesting time in the industry, and it's an exciting time for new ideas. And because time is of the essence, we are seeing ideas move from concept to test in much faster timeframes than ever before. Utilizing test tools and simulation during early stages of development helps shorten that concept to test timeline even more. The test industry in particular needs to be adaptable and ready to support whatever PNT solutions emerge. SOFA and OIL and other consortiums are helping to push development along. And I like something that I heard said about these consortiums that Product development is and must be moving at the speed of relevance. 
I think the recent DOT report may say it best, a plurality of services is going to be the best solution. But whatever the source, the story is the same. From the executive office, from Congress, and from the various departments invested in PNT, a layered system will capitalize on different technologies and different networks to complement the GPS PNT that so much of the world relies on. New requirements will be built into federal contracts. Contractors must show that they aren't depending on GPS only for PNT. And this is motivating industry to develop their own solutions. But I think these solutions are probably what you are all most interested in. So without further ado, I'll conclude my comments and hand off to Naveen. Thanks, Jen. And thanks to all of you for letting me share my, my perspective on navigation. The navigation world seems to be divided into two camps, the inertial people and the GPS people. I realize that this audience is probably going to be mostly GPS people, so I'm asking in advance for your forgiveness. You see, I'm one of the inertial people, and I'm sure some of my bias will come through despite my best efforts. My goal today is to share three things with you. First, I'll provide you an overview of inertial technology and how it has evolved over the years to solve three fundamental problems, pointing, stabilization, and navigation. Second, we'll discuss the navigation problem in a bit more depth and how inertial technology combines with other elements in different ways to provide resilient navigation solutions. And finally, we'll talk about a short PNT and my personal opinion on how to successfully deploy it in an affordable fashion. We've all seen inertial principles in action. Your childhood experiences with a toy top was probably your first time. The fact that an object rotating fast enough can stay in a fixed orientation was later mechanized in something that looks like a toy gyroscope by Frederick Bonnenberger. But when he made his device, the word gyroscope didn't exist, and he just called it a machine. The word gyroscope was coined by Leon Foucault. Gyroscope comes from the Greek gyros, or circle, and skopos, or watcher, which is a good description of Foucault's pendulum, which he used to sense and track the rotation of the Earth. In the early 1900s, these principles and toys were turned into a practical device to solve the pointing problem with the invention of an inertial ship gyro compass by Anschutz. Technology continued to progress, and the Germans deployed the V-2 rocket in World War II with a guidance package composed of two gyroscopes and one accelerometer to solve their navigation problem. The V-2 wasn't overly accurate, but it foreshadowed the development of accurate ballistic missiles and eventually the space program. An evolved version of that accelerometer is still used today in strategic missiles. The next major step in navigation came in the 50s when a team led by Doc Draper created an inertial navigation system that could find aircraft across the country. They used a computer, accelerometers, and gyroscopes to calculate position and flew a B-29 from Massachusetts to California in eight hours. Of course, it weighed 2,700 pounds, so it wasn't a practical system, but a practical inertial navigation system was created just six years later with the invention of the LN-3. It was a three degree of freedom, four gimbal inertial navigator that was small enough to fit in a jet fighter, the F-104G. Next came the development of laser gyros. With their excellent dynamic range, they didn't need a gimbal assembly, and this led, this led directly to the creation of the strap-down inertial navigation systems still in use today. The strap-down systems had a similar accuracy, but were much more reliable as moving parts of the gimbal were removed. The dynamic range of laser gyros and the removal of the gimbals also helped solve the stabilization problem as the real-time real motion of the INS could not be output. At the same time, small form factor GPS cards were introduced. These were compact enough to be embedded in the INS to create an EGI or embedded GPS INS. Since then, both gyroscope and accelerometer technologies have matured to fill a wide variety of needs. The fundamental problems of pointing, stabilizing, and navigating were solved, but evolving needs for better price points, performance ranges, and size, weight, and power, or SWAP, allowed a wide variety of tech sensor, te sensor, te sensor technologies to evolve. So. Gyros come in all shapes and sizes. North Grumman alone is developing, producing, or supporting seven distinct gyro technologies. We have spinning mass gyros, we have vibrating gyros, we have laser-based gyros, and even an atomic gyro. Why so many? The market needs them. Some applications can't fit or afford a large gyro. Some applications have requirements for bandwidth and noise that push them to laser-based optical gyros. And some applications have unique requirements, such as long life, that force them into very high-end solutions. For example, Northrop Grumman's HRG-based products have over 50 million operating hours without a single mission failure. If you have a billion-dollar satellite that you can't repair after it's launched, you're going to want to pick one of those. The performance range for gyros varies dramatically, 
and prices can range from a few dollars to tens of thousands of dollars per axis. The gyros aren't perfect, and even the best ones have some level of intrinsic error that can't be removed. The theory behind them can be ideal, but the mechanization into a device creates a susceptibility to temperature, turn on, electronic, and dynamic range of error modes. When we talk about gyro performance, we use terms like degrees per hour, which means the longer they operate, the more error builds up. For the pointing and stabilization problems, this time-based error buildup is mitigated and doesn't really impact performance because we're looking for a measurement at one point in time. But there are an issue in navigation where the system has to operate anywhere from a minute to 24 hours to days, depending on the application. Of course, GPS also solves a navigation problem with fantastic performance, and our customers have become addicted to a level of performance that is really hard to duplicate when GPS isn't available. We'll talk a bit more on that later. Today, Northrop Grumman focuses heavily on fiber optic gyros or fog technologies. These have the same advantages of high dynamic range seen in other laser-based gyro technologies, such as ring laser gyros, but with better bandwidth, improved reliability, and low noise. Launching a new gyro technology isn't easy. It took 10 years of development to convert the concept of a fog into a practical device. But after the core architecture was mastered, Northrop was able to scale the same fundamental design from tactical grade to navigation grade to near strategic grade mostly by increasing the amount of fiber added to the coil at the heart of the gyro. Today, we have four, four fog coils in full rate production and many more design concepts in the experiment stage so that we can continue to improve performance, improve yields, and improve cost. Looking ahead to the future, we are developing lower TRL, TRL technologies, both internally and through sponsored research at the university. We are experimenting with new fibers, including hollow core fibers, and new light sources. There's much more to learn before we fully exploit the potential of fogs. Accelerometers, by comparison, are much simpler to discuss. The market is well served by a blend of tactical grade, navigation grade, and strategic grade accelerometers. Many are available commercially. The near universal design is to create a mask on a flexible arm that will move in response to the acceleration force. The accelerometer then forces the arm back into a neutral state. That measured force is proportional to the acceleration the mask saw. This closed loop operation allows the accelerators to have a large operational range, up to 80 Gs is common. For context, a person typically can't take more than 10 Gs. This architecture can be mechanized in, in, a, in a micro or macro MEMS device, and that serves 99% of our needs in defense. Of course, you can vary size, weight, and power, and tweak the design to different levels of accuracy, which gives you the range of performance you see on the screen. The remaining 1% is the strategic grade system that leveraged modernized versions of the old German V2 accelerometer design. The 25 Pega on the bottom right is one of those. But like gyroscopes, accelerometers are sensing inertial forces, and even the best ones have some level of intrinsic error that can't be removed. Again, the mechanization into a practical device creates a susceptibility to temperature, turn on, electronics, and dynamic range error sources that Mark will talk about later. When we talk about Excel performance, they're usually specified with their own bias terms, with error building up the longer they operate like gyroscopes. When you combine these different gyro and install technologies together with electronics and software, a wide variety of systems emerge with both civilian and military uses. These systems vary dramatically in price, size, function, and end use, but they all rely on some combination of gyros and accelerometers to sense the inertial forces operating on them to help their host platforms solve one or more of the fundamental problems of pointing, stabilization, or navigation. A few highlights. At the top left, the LN200 is the premier tactical grade IMU in production. It has three FOGs and three MEMS scalpometers. It is used to stabilize and point ISR systems, provide attitude and heading information for cockpit displays, and also navigates over short ranges in some weapons. On the top right, the Scalable Space Inertial Reference Unit, or SIRU, uses four of our highly reliable HRG gyros to provide ultra-precise pointing for deep space missions. The bottom right is the LN260 EGI, which combines three navigation-grade FOGs and the A4 accelerometer triad along with an SPS or SASM GPS receiver to provide navigation unit for the modernized F-16s. And the bottom left shows the LN120G <clears throat> stellar inertial uh, navigation system, which combines an INS with a star tracking telescope, provides very precise pointing and very low drift navigation for specialized aircraft. When you look at a single platform, it can be surprising to see the number of places where inertial technology plays a role in helping the mission. 
In this view of the F-16, nine different inertial systems support different aspects of the mission. The LN-260, the main aircraft EGI, navigates and aviates the platform to its target. The ESA radar in the nose cone is stabilized by an LN-200. There's another LN-200 in the targeting pod, which is there to stabilize the camera and provide, to provide a clear image and identify the heading to get the vector to the target. The JDM that attacks the target has a different tactical radar view that navigates the weapon to its target. And last but not least, some F-16s have an electronic warfare capability that require the antennas to be stabilized, and that requires a special compact IMU. In this architecture, the main EGI aids and augments the secondary inertial navigation systems to transfer alignments, allowing all of them to leverage the higher performance of the EGI and the GPS receiver it contains. This minimizes overall cost and swap for the platform. Shifting gears, let's look at what makes up a um, let's, let's look at what makes up a complete modern PNT system. This model is agnostic towards the platform, so it should apply to any PNT architecture out there, from missiles to ground to aircraft. Think of each element as a node with a knob that can be turned from zero to 100%. Not every platform uses every node, but they rely on some combination of these nodes to get their PNT solution. It starts with signals in space coming from one or more constellations, going through an antenna into an anti-gem system knowing or being forming. The signal then flows into a GPS or GNSS receiver, which could be software defined in the future. The process data then flows into a PNT fusion engine where it's merged with inertial data from an IMU. Perhaps there's a GPS independent, independent time source and or alt-net inputs as well. The fusion engine comes up with the best possible solution from all those sources, which is then fed to the mission computer where it's consumed and distributed across the platform. With me so far? Okay, good. Now let's look at how these nodes are brought together in different combinations by our customers. This slide shows the same nodes in the same flow, but with boxes around different products and services representing how those are being bought. In some cases, such as the AG system, the IMU, or time source, a node could be a standalone line replaceable, line replaceable unit, or, or LRU, that is purchased from one vendor by an integrator who combines these with other products from different vendors to make a complete system. In other cases, such as the EGI or our again product, several nodes are combined into an integrated LRU that provides a one-stop PNT shop for the platform. Why such diversity? Many reasons, some of them historical, but also tied to the degree of control required or desired by the platform designer. In missiles, IMUs and GPS receivers are bought separately. That helps them with their packaging. Uh, they do have very tight space constraints. It reduces power needs of the systems operating on, it reduces the power needs with, uh, for these systems which operate on batteries, and also help, it also helps the, we the weapon vendor get tight control critical to maintaining flight control of the weapons. On the other hand, aircraft tend to buy integrated systems and leave the fusion of GPS inertial data to the EGI vendors. The space and power constraints are relaxed compared to weapons, so aircraft can afford the overhead of an integrated solution. Also, they perform, their performance needs are greater, and they require higher, higher quality of IMU and receiver. And given their continuous use, the GPS benefits from inertial aiding, and the inertial user, the inertial users, uh, the inertial uses GPS data to help estimate its long-term errors to calibrate them out. One trend that we are seeing clearly in future systems is the requirement for new systems to be to have more modularity, so that each individual node can be replaced and improved through future upgrades. This extensive software, where there's a strong desire to enable the hosting of third-party software into systems, so that future algorithms or applications can be brought into the PNT system to address future threats. Now let's talk a little bit about the future systems. PNT today is GPS dependent. Our customers, whether civilian or military, are dependent on GPS. Today's systems are closed and difficult to upgrade. They simply, aren't they simply weren't designed for modularity. I'm not trying to criticize choices made by early, ge early generations. Modularity does have an overhead cost in processing power that we couldn't afford to pay with other technologies. But those technologies have improved, and now we can afford them. These systems also operate on the basis of trust with very little in the way of cybersecurity and system security engineering. PNT tomorrow will be different. Don't worry, GPS will still be the primary and default source for accuracy, but we need to diversify the sources that are usable so that we can make the, make the task of denying this very difficult for our adversaries. This requires modular open architectures that are extensible and upgradable as technology improves in the future. It's very hard to replace NAS system on a platform once, once it's integrated. 
because they're tied in so intimately to, to the, other the, the other subsystems. The easier we can make it to upgrade them, the more useful they will be to our customers. And cybersecurity is a table stake and a requirement for all future systems. The future we see for tomorrow's systems is one where existing sensors can be used to aid the navigation system. If GPS is unavailable, why not leverage the onboard cameras or SAR images to integrate vision aid navigation to the solution? Our electronic warfare or comm systems can get vectors to friendly, neutral, or even enemy signals that are coming from a known location. Why not triangulate back to our own position? If we suspect our GPS is inaccurate, why not use GNSS or new Leo constellations to validate and perhaps replace the GPS component in our solutions? None of these solutions are several, so are, none of these solutions are silver bullets. They all have drawbacks, so a layered approach that can adapt among them is the best solution to make the air now job of our uh, as hard as possible for our enemies. The future sounds great, right? So how do we get there from how do we get from today to tomorrow? The challenge of the short uh, short PMT isn't creating the technology. The challenge is doing it affordably. We have to think about not only the cost of creating the new technology, but also the cost of installing it on thousands of platforms. It has to be done in a way that leverages our existing infrastructure while supporting the agile insertion of new technology as it matures and is ready to field. First, build a PNT fusion engine. We have to invest in these new modular architectures that are able to act as these fusion engines. These new systems are, need access to onboard sensors, the gyros and cells we talked about earlier, but also oscillators or clocks to provide short-term GPS independent time sources. Backwards compatibility with legacy interfaces is a key need so that, so that these new systems can replace legacy systems with minimal changes to the platform. This is the approach we're taking in our AGM system, where the design is backwards compatible with the form fit function of legacy EGIs, but with an open architecture that can scale to future needs. Second, use the best GPS available to you. Today, that's M code with backwards compatibility 1000. Third, Verify your signal. We use to trust GPS with complete confidence. Going forward, we need to do a trust but verify where we validate the data that we're getting with our onboard sensors from step one, which are very accurate over the short windows. We also need to cross-validate with other inputs from the, from the platform and or GNSS. Fourth, hold on to GPS for as long as you can. We've gone to a lot of trouble to get a trusted GPS signal through steps one through three, and we need to hold on to it uh, and recover it quickly if we lose it. This is where your anti-jam is layered in, and we also use our inertial and time aiding to help the receiver keep lock and reacquire quickly. Finally, we use AltNav. This is last not because of technology maturity, but because of expense. We often deal with old data networks on our existing platforms, and it isn't always easy to reroute signals. If you need to, and if you need to install a new sensor, you bring in a completely different set of challenges that slows down the pace of integration and slows down the pace of fielding. It's not easy to cut a hole in an aircraft or a telescope to look out at the stars. No one wants to go do it. In step five, we focus initially on leveraging existing sensors, your targeting pod, your radar, your comms. They all have a day job, but they can also send data to the PNT Fusion engine to help solve the navigation problem when GPS isn't available. In some cases, we'll need to do some work share where part of the processing done is done in the sensor itself so that the existing data pipelines can be leveraged. In other cases, we'll need to run new, new data lines or extend them to provide the bandwidth needed to transfer data between the nodes. Success here isn't just about accurate, uh, accurate position and time. Success is an accurate system that is affordable, installed easily, deployed widely, and upgraded quickly. And now I'll turn it over to Mark for the next presentation. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much, Naveen. Um, and just to keep the thank yous going, um, thank you to everybody on the call today for listening in. Um, we'll also shout out for the GPS World magazine for hosting today's event and the support from Danielle. Um, and especially, again, my colleague Rafael Zipakowski, who helped uh, generate some slides for me today's presentation. So what I'm going to concentrate on um, is two areas primarily um, from the perspective of the technology and the capabilities required for testing inertial navigation and also how to test this emerging trend for RF alternative navigation signal generation. Um, so first of all, from an inertial perspective, um, everyone with some curiosity and especially any budding inquisitive engineers uh, loves a spinning top. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, they are 
they are really quite quite a thing and uh, as Naveen mentioned earlier on many of us started out our engineering careers piqued by interest of how these things work and these days the idea of sensing inertial forces to provide um, a degree of um, navigation and awareness is the fact they are absolutely everywhere. So on the top left hand corner here, you can see in the nose cone of this, uh, of this aircraft, uh, an IMU is situated providing nav solutions. Um, the bottom left hand side there, a smaller version of that is being used in, in drones everyday use for microelectronic mechanical MEM systems due to their size and flexibility enable them to be going into your smartphones. There's a key part being played uh, with the emerging autonomous vehicles and assisted driving. So ultimately, these signals, these sensors are everywhere in our daily lives. And they offer a whole range of different applications and performances and price points, just as Naveen was mentioning earlier. Just taking one step back um, and looking at some actual mechanical IMUs, they offered incredible high accuracy um, navigation performance, but for extreme strategic use cases. And a great example of this was the unbelievable engineering that went into the advanced inertial reference sphere, AIRS, which was at the heart of the NAV solution for the, for the uh, Peacekeeper um, ballistic missile you can see on screen there. Um, obviously, it, that technology, that effort that went into making that particular IMU is just not fit for purpose for a huge array of um, applications which are needed today. And, but so many applications are crying out for uh, positional accuracy provided through IMU and inertial. So again, just building again a little bit on, what, um, on Naveen, there's, there's primarily uh, the key alternates um, in modern days for delivering that appropriate accuracy for longer range, cost, cost competitive, long-term use um, is predominantly through ring laser gyros and its more modern cousin, the fiber optic gyro. Um, as you can see here, these slides will actually be used a number of times as we go through as we, we talk about how we are then going to be able to use these to test their performance in both a stimulated and, and also more so in a simulated environment. What's also incredibly important with the testing of these devices is to be able to ensure if, with the, if the actual sensor is not present, that the realistic performance of the sensor is actually modeled. So there's two key areas which require modeling. In the top left hand side here, you can see the deterministic errors which are present in the sensor itself. The biases, the scale factors, the non-linearities, all of these have a very large bearing on the performance of the device. Further to that, they are going to be significantly affected by temperature and or variation. The other key area which needs to be taken into account from realism is the dynamic or stochastic errors. Allen variance is a method to measure that intrinsic noise as a function of averaging, uh, averaging over time. And it also is used to help identify and quantify the different noise elements that exist in an inertial data set. So when we're looking at modeling and simulating these effects of the sensor, these particular aspects need to be fully taken into account. The other area which needs to be taken into account when testing is actually the mission or motion realism. In this example here, we are showing the incredible maneuverability of an F-35 taken from a demonstration of its prowess in the 2017 Paris Air Show. But ultimately, being able to put those sensors through the full six degrees of freedom maneuvers 
is going to be vital to be able to ensure and assure that the performance that you're going to get in the real world um, is as expected. So I mentioned earlier that uh, there's probably two primary ways of actually testing um, uh, the sensor um, and the IMU itself, or, or actually stimulate, and first is to stimulate the sensors. So that can be done in, in this, as can be seen in the slide here, through the use of either a two axis or a three axis rate table, the actual device under test is placed into the table itself, often in a thermal chamber, and then through being able to drive the various two or three axis motors, with um, an appropriate um, drivetrain to, 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 to simulate the motion that was required, we can actually put the sensors themselves through their paces. Now, there's obviously some issues with doing this, um, and with every test case, there's pros and cons. The big positive for this is that the real sensors themselves are being stimulated. The difficulty comes from the possible lack of only a quasi-static trajectory. Obviously, the size and the weight and the health and safety aspects of these particular systems also needs to be considered. Another area to bear in mind is that there's a need, if there's a need for actually GNSS, a coherent GNSS injection, which is going to be sympathetic to that particular six degrees of freedom motion, that needs to be also injected into the chamber itself. It can be done, it's just not particularly easy. The other way of um, creating that test uh, solution is through simulation. So with simulation, first of all, we've already got that ability to provide a six degrees of freedom trajectory stream into our simulation environment. We can then actually have a model to simulate um, those various um, uh, deterministic and stochastic effects that I mentioned earlier on. You can then also have abilities to place those particular IMU sensors in a gimbaled or strapped down way at positions on the vehicle or airframe. And then, through some powerful um, mathematical modeling, we can generate the delta V and delta theta uh, data streams, which those sensors would have actually generated. Now, to bring the device under test into play, you need a specialist version of that DUT that's got a test interface, which effectively accepts that incoming stream of delta V or delta theta data and uses it instead of its uh, normal incumbent sensor sets. So this way, the DUT is being provided sensor information um, in a real-time way. It's being modeled and it's also not going to have the restrictions of being able to, will, will be able to be um, uh, put through its paces um, in a very a potentially extreme sixed off environment. The other piece to point out here is that as well as that delta V or delta theta, perhaps there's other wheel tick information or gyro information or barrow information, all of those other sensors which could be in and around the airframe or vehicle can also be stimulated and brought into the fusion engine alongside that delta V and delta theta signal. Putting that all together and from a spirant perspective, we have a number of tools which enable you to be able to configure, if I go left to right here, did the deterministic errors associated with that particular set of sensors. Um, you can be um, de deciding on which particular IMU you want to emulate. Do you want to be working with GPS as well? Do you want to load in a number of different stochastic errors? You can change the sensor update rates depending upon the different device under test. You can also have 
multiple different IMU models actually present on the same vehicle. You can have multiple gyros, multiple accelerometers. You could also select different gravity models. And all of that would be in sympathy with an incoming high iteration rate, six degrees of freedom trajectory. All of that then feeds into the device under test to be able to produce a positioning system, a positioning output. The other key thing there is you've got some truth data to be able to compare the actual DUT's performance with. So in a nutshell, before moving on to the AltNav RF piece, what we're saying here is that by having and using these specific test interfaces available on various EGIs and IMU systems, we can synthetically provide sensor data to be able to put that NAV um, solution through its paces in a very controlled and repeatable environment. Switching gears slightly to RF Alt NAV, um, as Jen mentioned at the start, and as uh, as Naveen said, emerging um, additional supporting signal types to support GPS and GNSS are gradually emerging. To be able to test that, Byron have been looking at the key attributes which a simulation system would require to enable the user to be able to put their um, AltNav plus GNSS system through its paces. To do that, the key elements are described on this, on this fairly busy but simple way, um, slide. At the top there, you can see that we've got a data stream, we've got a carrier, we've got a, we've got a PRN sequence, we've got a mechanism of modulating and combining the PRN with the navigation data, and then we've got a mechanism for taking that sequence and modulating it onto a carrier to take it up to RF. Now, for GNSS, those rules are firmly established in the signal and space ICDs. But what we need here for alternative RF, or alternative um, NAV RF, is the opportunity to provide the user to be able to go off piste from the signal and space ICDs and be able to define their own data sources, their own chipping rates, their own PRN sequences, their own waveform, um, wave shape, uh, edge shaping, their own modulation techniques. And what we are seeing is that as various RF um, alternates are emerging, primarily LEOs, they're using a number of them, oh, those underlying GNSS principles for the signal generation. And so you need a test environment which enables you to be able to experiment with those key areas I just mentioned. So the bottom of this chart is just actually just restating a um, modernized, for, 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 for um, the, the, the Beidou system, the various different modulations and chipping schemes and data rates that are used for the MEOs, IGSOs, and GEOs in, in Beidou 2. So again, this is where we have the facility to not be constrained to those signal and space ICD parameters. We've got the ability to be able to flexibly change those key parameters to enable the user to be able to experiment with emerging RF technologies. Further to that, um, especially if we talk about LEOs, it's really important to know that you need to still be able to simulate the motion of the actual satellites in space. So Spirant for many years have been leaders in simulating MEOs and LEOs. Well, we also have the capability to be able to simulate LEOs. So in this instance, you're expecting um, a much faster, higher dynamics, higher Doppler signal to be generated. The, the transition and um, 
time that you're going to see those satellites relative to MEOs is again incredibly smaller and more different. So there's more uh, handovers and there's more satellite changeovers as signals come in and out of view. All of that needs to be modeled alongside it being modeled with and sympathetic to the GNSS signal. So in the perfect world, what we need here is, a, is an application where you can set up your vehicle dynamics, you can set up your device under test, you can place it in time and space at a particular time and location, and then using a test tool, you can be simulating the GNSS signals for that location, but also sympathetic to that, using those flexible tools I just mentioned, as well as being able to model the actual LEO constellation, we want a composite of both GNSS and AltNav to be generated. Spirant now have those tools to be able to do that. Finally, the area which also adds another level of flexibility is using what we call SimIQ Capture and SimIQ Replay. Predominantly, SimIQ Replay is a way of being able to take a pre-existing IQ file which has already got built into it the particular nav stream, the modulation, the dynamics, the signal type, the PRN, all of that is built into the composite signal. And the technology that we have enables that signal to be in-fed into the simulator, um, but can then also be gen take that IQ signal, bring it up to RF, whilst also ensuring that it's sympathetic to other GNSS signals which are being generated on the fly. So a number of different ways to be able to support uh, alternative RF going forward, using the flexibility of changing nav data, nav content, bit streams, edge shaping, chipping rates through the tools in the simulator, but also if those pre-existing IQ files for those signals exist already, we've got the ability to be able to read those in in real time and simulate them sympathetic with the GNSS signals being simulated at the, at the, at the same time as well. I will pause at that point and hand over to Roger. Thank you for your time. All right, well, thank you, Mark, and uh, Naveen and Jen. <clears throat> I've got the last, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got the last segment here, and I'll uh, wrap up, uh, just give a quick recap of the, the need for going beyond just GNSS to achieve more resilient PNT. Give a little overview of uh, our capabilities and how Spirant products currently address non-GNSS sources. Give an application uh, following on to to Mark's discussion of uh, the simulator capabilities to a new product that uh, we have due out shortly, and then give a few words on some uh, new developments. So for decades now, GNSS has worked so well that we've made ourselves quite dependent on the availability of clean, uninterrupted signals. But because of the proliferation of intentional and unintentional interference with GNSS, Industry and government consensus is now that we have become over-reliant on GNSS. We really are in a remarkable period of policy changes and development of augmentation and alternatives to GNSS, as Jen has discussed. So while interference is getting a lot of attention right now, the need for alternative navigation sources is really twofold. First uh, is today's topic to improve the resiliency of GNSS against interference. Uh, but secondly, more demanding applications are emerging and simply require improved PNT performance. Strengthening PNT solutions is being pursued along multiple lines. First, with the RF-based solutions, the existing global navigation systems are actually quite similar in terms of operating frequency and power levels. Solutions offering greater resiliency in RF are exploring higher power levels, using frequencies outside of L-band, 
and applying new modulations with improved encryption and authentication. New systems are being uh, suggested that um, take advantage of signals not intended for navigation, and there are new systems specifically intended for navigation being introduced as well. The non-PNT inputs are impervious to RF jamming and spoofing. Some of them hark back to the earliest days of navigation, but are still useful along with the modern methods. Paired with GNSS, they can improve PNT resilience and performance. This table shows the non-GNSS sensor types currently supported by Spirant. All of them run simultaneously from the same scenario along with the GNSS RF generation. You'll see they're distributed among several products because the output types are variously Ethernet packets, analog voltages, and RS-422 serial data. I'll return to that disparity in a, in a following chart. So Mark has mentioned the other two capabilities shown in the chart. The SIM-IQ allows users to replay a signal file represented as in-phase and quadrature samples. These can be either recorded data or user-calculated waveforms. And then the flex capability gives the user the ability to create customized waveforms. The products on the previous table run under control of SimGen uh, with tight time synchronization to the GNSS signal generation. Now, while the primary application for the um, Spirant simulator has been for GNSS operating the L band, Spirant has also long supported uh, inertial navigation, as Mark has talked about, and uh, signals in other bands. The, uh, the ground based augmentation system, or GBAS, capability is supported by the GSS 4150 product um, provides signals at uh, VHF, and the S-band component of the Indian Regional NAVIC system is also supported. And then there have been uh, others, a, a third-party integration operates at the, the very low frequencies of ELORAN. So outside of L-band signals are being considered for a number of the alternative navigation approaches. So we think we're well suited to, uh, to handle those other frequency ranges. The programmability of the simulator lends itself to adaptation for alternative PNT applications. So as one example is the, uh, the SIM AltNav replay application shown here. The IQ playback capability that Mark mentioned is used with existing hardware to generate RF signals for a space-based alternative RF source. The input IQ files incorporate the satellite data, the satellite motion, and the user trajectory. Then the first phase of the development due out shortly, predefined input files representing several user scenarios will be provided. The next steps planned uh, will allow user-defined motion and then uh, ultimately we'll hope for a full hardware in the loop capability. So in today's discussion, alternative uh, is in reference to GNSS. So the SIM AltNav replay can run standalone, but for its purpose as an alternative PNT source, it makes sense that it would be run along with GPS. So the SIM AltNav replay can be integrated to run alongside GNSS with very tight time alignment. So what we've seen in testing of the playback signals into an actual receiver is uh, showing good results, and we're in final release preparations and uh, plan first delivery in uh, September of this year. So on a closing note, I'll mention a couple of developments that are in the works at Spirant. So the products and capabilities table from a few charts back showed that the sensor capabilities that we have are divided among several products. Government and industry are desirous of moving from these application-specific interfaces to having an open standard for navigation sensor interfaces with the goal of simplifying integration efforts and broadening the selection of sensors available to the system designers. Spirant is presently developing an open Ethernet interface to unify our sensor simulations. 
And lastly, plans for the uh, large LEO constellations, using them for navigation are in various phases of, of development. These include um, taking advantage of signals not necessarily intended for navigation, as well as some new navigation purpose constellations. So Spirant's working with uh, with these developing systems, and it looks that the uh, the SIM-IQ and the flexible waveform capabilities show promise for the quick turnaround solutions. So that uh, concludes our presentations for today. On behalf of uh, Spirant, thank you for joining us. And Danielle, we'll pass it back to you for closing remarks and questions. Great, thanks Roger. And thank you all for a great presentation. Um, at this time, we're gonna jump into some questions that we received during registration and a couple that we got um, during the live presentation. If you have any questions for the panelists, feel free to submit them in the Q&A panel on the left side, left hand side of your screen. Um, our first question is for uh, Naveen. Um, some companies have supposedly been working super high performance IMU parts um, for years, but there have seemingly not been any products available. Are some of those efforts finally coming to fruition in the new, near future? That's a great question. Uh, in the early part of my career, GPS was the panacea, and there was little interest in improving inertial performance. Um, that did change about five years ago, and we've seen an increased investment, both internal and government funded. Uh, the challenge is that a new INU can take five to ten years to mature. So we, we do have an evolution of our L200 that is being already being tested by our major customers. Uh, we have an INU that uh, should be released next year for weapons, and a third uh, that is still in development. I, I don't want to get into details uh, uh, to avoid taking my hand to my competition, but we will be at JNC and we'll have discussions and be able to provide demos to, inter to, to, to interested parties in August. Excellent. Thank you. Um, let me see here. Um, in today's world, security and, and, and integrity has become a major issue in critical systems. How much emphasis is being given to prevent hackers um, and other would-be enemies from doing harm to our P&T systems? Would any of you like to take a stab at that one? <laughs> I can take, okay. I can take a cut at it. Uh, it relates to the okay. uh, the points I was making about uh, cybersecurity. Um, so uh, uh, you know, until uh, I'd say you know, uh, all of our all of our systems in production today uh, were meant to operate in a trusted environment. The protection was coming from soldiers with guns uh, protecting the system, and there were there wasn't really much of a, a focus on cybersecurity. But going forward, those are just table stake requirements now. We're getting requirements where they have to be baked in, those protections have to be baked in, and so they're being designed into our next generation of systems. Now, this is for the EGIs. For the IMUs, they, they will be operating in a more trusted environment, and so uh, the, it's not much of a requirement there. But for any uh, high-end NAS system, those are core requirements. Great. Thanks, Naveen. Let's see. Um, another question here uh, for Roger. Um, will GPS be able to recover functionality in the event of higher than normal solar flare or income, incoming cosmic radiation? Okay, this one's uh, interesting because there are some uh, vulnerabilities to just natural vulnerabilities to GPS itself. We spend a lot of time talking about jamming, spoofing, interference kind of things, but uh, there are uh, Natural effects that uh, affects the uh, GPS satellites themselves and the uh, um, and the signal as it's transmitted uh, from the constellation down to the down to the receivers. So on the on the GPS satellite themselves, um, they are still designed with uh, fully designed with radiation hardened um, electronics in there and uh, redundant systems. So there are unlikely to be damaged or, or taken offline um, by the, other than an extraordinary solar event or cosmic radiation. So they're, they're pretty uh, robust in that, in that regard. So the, the bigger effect that you're gonna see is that those uh, solar events 
affect the uh, ionosphere, the atmosphere as the signal is received. You can have some uh, some very high rates on the ionospheric delays that can, can cause issues, um, fluctuations in signal levels. So those things will wash out as the uh, as the event goes away. So I think those are the uh, primary pieces to the question. So I think the satellites themselves are, are pretty robust. They have spares in orbit, so I think it would recover quickly from any uh, short-term outages. And then, of course, on the, the receiver end, as the, uh, as the event washes out, the receivers on the ground will, will lose those effects. OK, thank you, Roger. Um, Mark, a question for you. Um, could you share any information on 5G positioning testing capabilities? Uh, yeah, that's a, a good good question. So, um, Spirit have a capability already um, for for providing location location test services for both 3G, 4G, and 5G. Not from the perspective of uh, the measurement being taken from the 3G, 4G, or 5G signal but purely from the perspective of the GNSS overlay uh, being simulated alongside a network emulator, which is generating the appropriate um, uh, radio signal. So if the question is, is regards to genuine um, over-the-air ranging um, time of arrival related um, testing with 5G signals, it's certainly something which is is on our radar, um, albeit we're looking to try and ensure that all sensors and signals which can be used for providing improved navigation solutions, whether that be based upon cameras, whether that based upon radio signals, whether that be cell signals such as 5G, we want to, we're aiming to try and have a holistic view of providing a test solution for all of those signal types. So right this moment, um, we don't have a 5G emulator which can do over the uh, time of arrival like signaling, but we can support the same 5G type testing as we've done with 3G and 4G in the past. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, one other question for you, Mark. Um, um, are there any flight dynamics generators that emulate the noise uh, terms in real aircraft flight? Ah, that's a good, another good question. I, I'm, not, so I'm not aware of the, any tools themselves but I could certainly take that offline and have a think about it. Um, the opportunity to overlay those sorts of uh, um, effects in into the six degrees of freedom motion data, which we coming into the simulator is definitely possible. And we've definitely had customers that are generating their own six DOF who are then imparting some degree of vibration or gust over the top of the center of gravity six DOF uh, trajectory. I'm not aware of any tools which will automatically 
allow you to generate those those um, those, those those sorts of offsets to the trajectory. But I can certainly have have a look. The simulator itself, though, if those effects were imparted onto the sixth off, the simulator will, will be um, taking that into account when it is simulating the trajectory of the vehicle, especially with our one kilohertz and two kilohertz system iteration update rates, which gives very, very fine control um, of small perturbations of, of motion.